Good afternoon, everyone. Your microphone will be muted throughout the event. You can use the chat function to ask questions during the event, and the speaker will answer at the end of the talk. Please note, this event will be recorded. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Azlina Amir Abbas, Consultant Orthopedic Surgeon at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, who will now share with us the training part Again, please join me. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Azina Amir Abbas, consultant orthopedic surgeon at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya, who will now share with us the training pathway on orthopedics. Hey, thanks, Anapia. I'm going to share my screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. I think you need to allow me to share. You can share the slide now, Doctor. All right, I got it now. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks to the um, organizers for uh, inviting me to speak on this uh, training pathways for orthopedics in Malaysia. Um, orthopedics is the specialty that deals with uh, musculoskeletal uh, injuries or, or conditions. I think to the lay person and even to some other specialties, we are the uh, specialty that is pretty much brawn, not much brain. Uh, we are the carpenters of the body and those are some of the other common terms people uh, refer to us as. Uh, fortunately, we have pretty good sense of humor about a lot of things. And so we are able to brush them off or, or even <laughs> rebut um, you know, uh, when the need arises. Uh, we don't take ourselves so, too seriously. Uh, and <laughs> I guess it sounds like for some people, we don't take other people too seriously either. The term of orthopedics um, actually is first coined in 1741 by Nicholas Andry. Um, the tree of Andry that you see here is the symbol of orthopedics. Uh, and it does show why orthopedics is called orthopedics. So the term orthopedics come from Greek uh, language, meaning to correct or straighten a child. And it's really because uh, in, in the olden days, I guess, um, it's very common to see children with congenital deformities uh, or musculoskeletal deformities, and they naturally uh, sought to be treated. And so a majority of, of orthopedic patients uh, in those days probably were tended to be children, uh, not, not counting all the traumatic injuries. But actually the history of orthopedics goes even further back uh, than 1741. Um, in ancient Egypt, we can find hieroglyphs that, that shows uh, evidence of orthopedic practice, although that's not what it may have been called at that time. Um, we have hieroglyphs that show surgical instruments, uh, not just your scalpel and the such, but if, including drills and saws. Um, there's pictures of people trying to reduce uh, dislocated joints, uh, such as the one on the left. Um, Hippocrates in Greece, um, improved our understanding of anatomy, and that certainly is very important for ortho, but actually in general, all surgical fields. Um, the late 19th century or early 20th century is when our knowledge of an understanding of traumatic injuries and how to, to treat them uh, improved by um, Hugh Owen Thomas in the UK. Um, if his name sounds vaguely familiar, it's uh, the same Thomas that created the Thomas's sign, for the, the, to rule out fixed fraction deformities in the hip. And he is also the creator of the Thomas's splint, um, which is a splint to keep uh, lower limbs straight and intact in the case of fractures. And in fact, it was the Thomas's splint that was used by his nephew, Sir Robert Jones in World War I, uh, which helped to dramatically reduce the mortality rate from femoral fractures uh, as a result of the war. Uh, this is early 20th century. Mid 20th century, uh, you know, orthopedics advanced even more uh, with the creation of the uh, hip replacement implant by Sir John Chanley. Um, and really, once John Chanley started this off, it really opened the doors to um, how we improve our how we manage patients with with orthopedic problems from uh, 
implants such as nails and plates to prosthetics such as the, the hip and knee replacement implants that you see here. Um, John Chanley was not only interested in metal work or carpentry, so to speak, he was actually also interested in infection rates and actually some of his concepts or some of his ideas that he, he, he um, practiced in the 60s uh, even um, adopted even now, such as the use of antibiotic uh, prophylaxis, prophylactic antibiotics, laminar airflow in the operating theater. Um, orthopedics has really advanced a lot since Chandi's time, uh, not just in the materials that we use to fix fractures or fix uh, bones, but also the instruments that we use. So the picture at the bottom um, shows you a surgeon doing navigated um, knee replacement. We use robotics also in our regular practice. In Malaysia, the history of orthopedics is not so old. Uh, we are less than 100 years old in Malaysia officially. Um, the first orthopedic unit opened in 1949 in KLGH. Uh, prior to that, it was uh, orthopedics was practiced really by surgeons in the Department of Surgery. Um, with the formation of this unit, uh, naturally more and more Malaysians started to go away for, for further training. And the first Malaysian orthopedic surgeon uh, came back in 1958, uh, Tan Sri Abdul Majid Ismail, uh, who became DG of Health uh, in the 70s. Um, in 1963, the first medical faculty in Malaysia, the first teaching hospital and the first teaching orthopedic department uh, opened in University of Malaya. And in order to uh, have the manpower to teach as well as to, to provide services in the then University Hospital, um, there were a lot of expatriate orthopedic surgeons that were brought into Malaysia. Um, Dr. De Silva was um, the first head of department in orthopedics, but uh, there are other expatriate um, orthopedic surgeons who, who entered our country and have stayed since. In 1967, the Malaysian Orthopedic Association was formed. Uh, these are some of the founding fathers. Literally, they are the founding fathers. A couple of them are expatriates. Like I said, they came from away. They moved here and they stayed here all, all their lives. Um, Tan Sri Abdul Majid was the head, uh, what became the president of the MOA from 1967 until the early 80s. Um, in 1985, the first batch of master's orthopedic trainees uh, graduated from UKM. And UKM was the first university in the country to provide, uh, uh, to provide specialty training. The master's program was the brainchild of Prof Kazi Iqbal. He was an expert who came to UM. He was an academic staff in UM and he moved to UKM to set up the department over there. Uh, following this, I think within, in 1989, UM, University of Malaya started their master's and the other universities followed suit a few years after that. Uh, 1988, Professor Tunku Sara joined the department in UM, becoming the first female orthopedic surgeon in Malaysia. We are quite fortunate that we are pretty diverse here in Malaysia. Our female orthopedic surgeons constitute approximately 10% of the total surgeons in Malaysia, total auto surgeons in Malaysia. I think we're doing pretty well in that sense, um, better than even maybe the US or the UK. Um, in 2003, the Conjoint Board of Orthopedics uh, was formed. Uh, it's now known as the Orthopedic Specialty Committee. And really, it's this board that looks over uh, training of uh, orthopedics in Malaysia. So we are the, the, this board is the one that's responsible to, to, to say that, yes, you are qualified to be an orthopedic surgeon. and You are qualified to get your, your degree from whichever university you enroll in. The OSC comprised the six universities that um, offer a Masters of Orthopedic Surgery. Um, uh, it also had, within the board, there is members from the Ministry of Health, the Academy of Medicine, and the Malaysian Orthopedic Association. At present, there is no parallel pathway for orthopedics in Malaysia. The only way to be an orthopedic surgeon in Malaysia, if you are still in Malaysia, not planning to go overseas for training, is really through the University Masters Program. And this is offered by the six universities, uh, three in KL, UKM, UM, and UPM, USM in Kota Baru, Unimas in Kuching, and UIA in Pantan. Um, of late, uh, the private healthcare has, uh, private universities have started, and the first one who have started to do a master's training um, for ortho uh, is KPJUC. Um, to enroll in this, though, you would have to resign from MOH um, to, to participate. Okay. 
this is just a summary of how long it would roughly take for you to be an ortho surgeon. On average, it takes about eight years. If you consider that from the time of graduation, if you start your housemanship immediately, that's two years of housemanship if you're not being extended or you don't run into any issues. Um, in general, when you finish your housemanship, you should try to get into an orthopedic department um, uh, and, and really to, to improve your knowledge and hone your skills. Um, the entry requirement, the minimum is six months of orthopedic experience, but naturally, if you have more than six months, it would be preferred. The training program itself is four years. So if you add it all up, it's four plus two plus two. It's about eight years from, from the time you start your housemanship before you can qualify as an orthopedic specialist. The training program itself is a four-year program. And the minimum is four. The maximum is seven. And this is the limit set by all universities, uh, which is seven years. We recruit an average of 80 uh, trainees per year divided by all the universities. They are spread out through 30 accredited centers and trained by 150 to 200 trainers. Uh, in general, the structure is that the first two years, you concentrate mainly on the general auto and the trauma related uh, conditions. Uh, and really because in Malaysia, trauma is, is pretty much bread and butter. The last two years as you gain uh, more ex surgical experience and you are uh, more senior, then you go through the subspecialty rotations such as pediatric orthopedics, oncology, joint replacements, etc. To pass the program, um, there are actually three major hurdles. Uh, you have to sit and pass the part one exam. The part one exam is attempted within the first year. It's very basic science-centric, anatomy, physiology, pathology. Um, Candidates who have OSC part one or the MRCS may be exempted. Uh, some universities accept that. Um, everyone has to sit the part two, which is the exit examination. That's usually conducted at the end of your fourth year. It's more clinically based. And uh, it consists of written exams, OSCE, VIVA, clinical cases. And of course, the last one uh, is the research project or dissertation. So three major hurdles to, to, to graduate, basically. The application process really depends on whether you are a fully MOH sponsored or a candidate or whether you intend to go into the private candidate pathway. I'll cover the first one first, the MOH sponsored, which presumably all medical officers will be, um, you know, as part of your uh, training towards getting full registration and experience and your compulsory service. So if you're working in MOH um, and you've, you've you have the minimum of six months of experience. You've been in orthopedic department now for at least a year and a half to two years. Um, you know, wait, wait for the opening or the call for application to postgraduate training programs. This is a general call for all the for all the specialties, not just for orthopedics. Usually, it's it's opened up in July or August, but last year with COVID, it opened a little bit later, which is in September. So just you know, keep your eyes and ears open and, and listen for, for when the uh, application, the advertisement comes out. Uh, if you don't catch it on the KKM webpage, normally the advertisement will be directed to the hospital directors and the HODs who then should be the ones to dis disseminate this information to you. Um, once you have it, you have one month to upload your application for KKM to, to shortlist. If you're a private candidate, uh, if you're a Malaysian and you say, no, I don't want to go through the MOH pathway, I want to resign from MOH, you know, join as a private candidate uh, or as a trainee lecturer. And certainly international candidates are all considered private candidates. You apply directly to the university of choice. Uh, and it's the head of department at the university who, who uh, shortlist you based on certain criteria by the university as well as to make sure that you're, if you're a foreign candidate, that your degree is recognized by the Malaysian Medical Council. Once you're shortlisted by both parties, um, then you will be invited um, to the, what we call the selection for postgraduate orth orthopedic training, um, which is our entrance exam, so to speak, uh, to enter masters. Uh, it consists of two parts, which is the written examination and the OSCE. The written examination is compulsory for everyone, except if you already have the OSC part one, which I will talk about afterwards, as or the MRCSB. Um, and then if you, you have that criteria or you are selected from the written examination, we whittle down the numbers um, for the OSCE. The examination is conducted by the OSC and we look at a few other criteria um, to determine whether you're selected to master's training. Um, this is a general flow chart. Uh, so naturally, if you have 
the OSC Part 1 or the MRCSB, you're exempted from the written examination, but if not, you have to sit for it. Just to give you an, a rough idea, every year we get 250 to 300 applications, um, out of which about 40 have either the OSC Part 1 and or the MRCSB. So they are exempted from the written examination. So they jump straight into the OSCE stage. Um, the remaining 200 plus uh, will have to sit the written examination. And from that, we, we select another 100 or so to join the other 40 in the OSCE stage. And from the OSCE stage, we select the top 80 candidates. So on average, you know, we get about 25% that we, we select out of all applicants. So you've heard me talk a bit about the OSC Part 1. The OSC Part 1 is an examination which normally you're supposed to sit if you're in master's within the first year of your, of your training. But we also allow um, medical officers who have not joined master's yet, but who want to attempt this examination um, to attempt it, all right? The format, the everything is exactly the same as how it would be when you're in the master's program itself. It's not a, it's not a different examination at all. It's exactly the same exam. Um, you can look up the website uh, for more details about the syllabus, the registration fees, the venue and the timing of, of examination. So I won't go too much into it. If you have this before you join master's, then actually your, your exam in year one of master's, you don't need to sit that again. So you don't need, you sit this once and that's it. You don't need, you sit and pass, you don't need to sit it again. So do you need it really? Do you really need it before master's? It's nice to have because as you can see, if you have it, uh, you're exempted from the written examination uh, of this selection process. You already skip one step. You, you jump ahead, you're fast tracked into the OSCE stage, which is really the selection stage. Um, if you have the OSC part one, like I said, your master's part one, once you're enrolled in the master's program, then you are exempted from sitting the exam again. If you have MRCSB, some universities exempt you from the part one, not all, okay? Um, the good thing of having the OSC part one or the MRCS before you join is obviously, if you're exempted from the exam in that first year, you can fully concentrate on surgical training for the full four years. Uh, we find that a lot of trainees, if you, you can't get through your part one exam uh, for whatever reason, it does affect your training in a sense that you tend to go to less OTs, you go to less clinics, you, you're, you're not focused on the surgical training per se because you're really trying to get through this, this basic hurdle. So if you get through this hurdle, even before you must, your master's, you actually do save some time and you can really improve your surgical skills uh, for the full four years. Some tips to getting into master's program, um, because like I said, only 25% um, do get in. Um, is that uh, while you're waiting for your housemanship uh, uh, call, a uh, good idea to work as a research assistant in any of the orthopedic departments or units in the universities is really to get make yourself known and familiar to, to the university or, or the department that you intend to work to, to enroll in. Uh, try to do projects, publish, present, you know, improve your knowledge and your understanding of orthopedics as well as attend certain courses. Once you start working though, naturally you need to be, you know, no major disciplinary issues. The, the, um, your penilaian prestasi is pretty important. You, it needs to be 85% and above uh, for two successive years. So if your first year you're 90%, your second year you're only 80%, for example, um, uh, you, you can't apply. Uh, even if you do apply, KKM will, will weed you out, will, will, short, will take you out of the list you won't be called for the spot, all right? So, and again, if you want to, you can attempt all the various examinations. Do keep a logbook of all the cases that you've seen and manage. The future is that, of course, we will introduce the parallel pathway, uh, which is a, a, an examination that is currently in development uh, with the uh, College of Surgeons. Um, in brief, the timing, in terms of timing, they're exactly the same. The actual training period is still four years. Uh, whether you're doing masters or whether you're doing uh, the parallel pathway. The difference obviously is in the university pathway, you get a master's degree. In the parallel pathway, you get a joint surgical fellowship qualification. Um, you have to sit the MRCS if you, if you once the parallel pathway is introduced. Um, and I think with parallel pathway, most of the training centers are within the KKM hospitals. You don't need to come to the universities. If you're thinking whether ortho is for you, well, these are a few questions you may want to ask yourself. 
Are you able to think on your feet and be flexible in managing patients, in, especially in emergency situations? Um, do you have excellent hand-eye coordination? Essentially, this is useful if you're going to do arthroscopic procedures, navigation, et cetera. Um, can you see beyond the patient's injury to their recovery, rehab, and return to society and function? And uh, you know, are you able to tie in a lot of scientific theory like biomechanics, uh, you know, um, tissue engineering, stem cell sort of philosophies to your practice in rigorous and effective way? And certainly, if you have all this plus passion and commitment, uh, maybe you may want to consider orthopedics as a training, um, as a specialty for you. Some reasons people do ortho, I mean, they find it very satisfying because it's, it's almost instant gratification, so to speak. Uh, if you imagine someone has a fracture today, you fix it, and within the next day or two, so-and-so is able to go back to work. So it's, you really do make quite a difference, not only to your patient's lives, but certainly for yourself, it's, it's quite rewarding in that way. We have a wide range of subspecialties to choose from. Literally every bone, joint, and muscle from your neck down to your toes is under orthopedics. And we manage patients of all ages from newborns to the elderly. Uh, as I mentioned before, we link a lot of scientific knowledge to clinical practice. You need to have a good appreciation of anatomy. We combine a lot of theoretical knowledge uh, and, and a lot of technology. Uh, we conduct lots of hands-on courses to get you familiar. Um, and we have a wide interaction with multidisciplinary teams and industry. I think most important for me is certainly we are a very sociable specialty. As you've heard me start off, uh, heard me say in the beginning, uh, we don't take ourselves seriously. We have a pretty good sense of humor. So we really know how to let our hair down uh, and, and relax. Uh, so it's a good friendly fraternity. And I think um, if you do decide to join orthopedics, you will not regret it. I never wanted to do when I was a medical student. I never wanted to go into ortho, but somehow I ended up in this field and certainly no regrets uh, all these years after. Uh, with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Azlina, for that mm -hmm. very informa informative session. Professor Dr. Azlina will now be taking question that in, that in the chat box. Okay, hold on. So the chat box is the US MLE pathway accepted in Malaysia. Um, no, it's not. Uh, if you're talking about um, residency training, I think if you're coming back from the US, um, do we still have to undergo housemanship in Malaysia? Okay, so if you finish residency in US, normally it means you're already a qualified orthopedic surgeon. Uh, that's how it is. And if you're already a qualified surgeon, actually you should be able to practice in Malaysia as an orthopedic surgeon without having to go through the uh, master's program. Uh, it's just like um, people who come back from the UK with the FRCS trauma and orthopedics. Um, you're qualified, it's a recognized qualification in Malaysia. Um, so therefore, when you come back, you just have to make sure that uh, the MMC approves that you are able to register with the National Specialist Registry, which is the NSR, um, and you can you know, go ahead and straight away start um, um, practicing as a full-fledged orthopedic surgeon. So you don't need to go through these two pathways. Um, if you have not finished residency, let's say you have just finished internship in the US and you decide to return to Malaysia, for example, then yes, you would have to go through the, either one of these pathways that I, I described. Anything else? Most welcome. Uh, yeah, this was the question that was uh, posed to us earlier also. Uh, contract system, of course, I think uh, the Ministry of Health is trying to address the issues related to uh, further training for you, uh, whether it's the master's or the parallel pathway. Um, I think either way, uh, if you're on the contract system and if we have the parallel pathway, the key is not um, 
uh, not about whether your contract or not. The key is whether you fulfill the other eligibility criteria to enter um, specialty training. Um, we hope that the parallel pathway will be, well, we, we hope that it would be launched this year, but I think with COVID, et cetera, the discussions and the formatting with the College of Surgeons in the UK uh, is, uh, you know, kind of taken a few steps back. So um, we hope within the next couple of years, the parallel pathway will be available. Um, and that uh, certainly it opens the doors to more than just 80 trainees per year to join uh, orthopedic training. I think once the pathway opens up, uh, the biggest benefit is that more, more um, medical officers can be trained rather than just 80 per year. How would I describe the work-life balance? <laughs> okay, um, I think, uh, okay, the, the story with me is this. When I finished medical school, I never wanted to do ortho because I hated my, my orthopedic consultant when I was a medical student. So I said, never do ortho. And I really wanted to do ortho, uh, obstetrics and gynecology. And, um, but I swapped from obstetrics to, to ortho. And it was really because uh, I saw a consultant on call running one day and I asked her, where are you headed to? She says, to the labor room. I said, well, are you on call today? And she goes, no. And that was a light bulb moment for me because it really made me think that, well, okay, uh, that's not the work-life balance that I was looking for. Um, I wanted to be able to at least sit down and have my dinner. Um, I like to be able to enjoy some weekends. And this consultant was single lady. It was 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. It's like 8 p.m. Saturday, you're supposed to be out dating, not running to labor ward when you're not on call. So I think work-life balance in auto is actually pretty good. Uh, obviously, it depends which type of such specialty you end up in. Um, some specialties, uh, you, you literally have to run, um, especially in emergency situations. There are some specialties where you kind of go, okay, we can, we can slow down a little bit. So I think work-life balance in auto is pretty good. Um, it's a good fraternity. I think all specialties, you know, they're within the fraternity, everyone is very good. Um, but certainly for orthopedic surgeons, our, our personality tends to be a bit gila, uh, a bit laid back. Um, and you will find that it's, it's pretty rewarding and quite fun to be uh, in the group. Um, I think uh, there's no biasness whether you're female, therefore, you know, you should go on leave, lah, this, lah, that, lah. But, uh, you know, everyone's pretty understanding in our, in our fraternity. So I think you will find that it's, it's pretty balanced. Thanks, Sonia, for the question. I think, Doctor, we have another two more minutes for, I think, for another one question, Doctor. Most welcome. I think the key is really knowing what you want out of the different specialties in your, you know, that you're exposed to. Um, you know, all specialties have their pros and cons naturally. So, you know, just opening your eyes, broad, broadening your horizon, seeing what everyone has to offer would be really good. Help you make a decision. Good. Uh, any questions? I don't see any more question in the chat box. Maybe yeah. they directly message you, doctor, professor? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it looks like they are getting... <laughs> Do I need to work as a HO? Yeah, most of them are sending directly to me. <laughs> I see, okay, I see. Do I need to work as a HO at teaching hospital to increase, increase my chance for training? No, not really. Um, we, it would increase your chance if you're planning to join an academic um, institution i.e. as a trainee lecturer or, you know, as a private candidate. But if you are going to be, um, you have no aspirations to be a, a teaching staff or a lecturing staff, uh, really, I think everyone has got equal opportunities. Um, whether you do your housemanship in, in uh, Ministry of Health or the teaching universities. In some sense, I have to be honest, I, I did my housemanship in a teaching hospital. Um, there's pros and cons to it, naturally, because if you are in a teaching hospital, you get a lot of teaching. But in terms of your hands-on experience, you are a little bit um, 
left behind because you have to compete with your seniors who are in training and therefore they get the priority for, for clinical cases. Um, and so I think for hands-on experience, for clinical experience, certainly nothing beats the Ministry of Health. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Azina, for that excellent session. Uh, I'm sure the participant will be leaving the session today with a much clearer understanding on what is required in achieving their dreams of being a specialist in the field of orthopedics. Um, once again, thank you very much. Most welcome, everyone. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Okay. All right. Dear delegates, thank you very much. And I hope that you have you have found that this session very informative informative um we have now came uh, come to the end of the hour uh, to our session so take care and stay safe whenever you are thank you very much bye thank you